Hello, everybody, um, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are in the world today. And uh, wherever you are on the globe, I hope everyone is keeping safe and well under current circumstances. I'd like to uh, now take some time to talk with you about the importance of working with your uh, CMO during product development, um, how the CMO can, can help you, can assist you, and really facilitate that development process to make sure your test gets to market when you want it to get there and at a, at a cost and budget that is in line with your expectations. So before I dive into that detail, I would just like to uh, take a couple of moments just to give you an introduction really as to who and where we are and what we do essentially. So I guess everyone, everybody would, would agree that 2020 has been uh, a relatively uh, challenging year so far. And there have been, I guess, significant changes for everyone around the world. There have been a number of changes within uh, Abin and Health. I mean, over since the beginning of 2020, uh, where we are now, it, it's almost uh, a, complete, a completely different company in terms of uh, what we have facility-wise. So just to give you uh, a quick sort of rundown regarding that. So beginning of this year, we had uh, the one manufacturing site where we also had uh, R&D, tech transfer, uh, sales and marketing, finance, essentially our headquarters. And that was at the York Biotech Campus, a few miles outside the historic city of York in uh, the UK, and it's a uh, biosecure site. Um, we had been there for um, a number of years. Now, one of the challenges that 2020 threw at us was a requirement to significantly ramp up our production capacity you know, to, to meet the demand uh, for uh, tests relating to the global pandemic, but also to keep in line with our, our customers' business growth. So to that end, there's been significant investment at Armindon. So we now have a second manufacturing site, which is based in Doncaster um, in, in the UK. And we still have a, a satellite R&D facility based in the West Midlands. That expansion hasn't just been, if you like, for uh, the manufacturing footprint and the actual sort of square meterage. There have also been significant uh, investment in terms of people and the required equipment. So, if you are, uh, if you have been involved with the, the lateral flow world previously or something that you were now researching, um, you, you would have already heard uh, brand names such as uh, Biodot, Genolis, Kinematic, et cetera. So we've invested heavily in uh, new uh, Biodot reel-to-reel reagent dispensing equipment or to laminators, and we ha will have multiple uh, Genolis systems. Uh, live before the end of the year, which, uh, very, uh, which are very much the um, cutting edge, really, in that sort of final assembly piece when assembling the uh, lateral flow assay device. Because of the nature of the business we're, we're involved with, as you would imagine, our sites meet all quality standards and certifications you know, uh, required. And we've... Uh, basically grown since 2008 by um, acquiring complementary diagnostic businesses, not, not only to strengthen our position within this particular market, but also really to uh, enhance the offering uh, that is open to, uh, to our customers, now, be it for contract development and then manufacturing or pure contract, contract manufacturing. In terms of what we do, as I previously mentioned, it's there is a choice. Um, flexibility is key, basically. So we have um, a global client base, UK, Europe, North America, Far East, and we essentially are a contract manufacturing organization specializing in uh, rapid tests, specifically lateral flow assays. We also have 
a contract development component to that. So we can be involved, if you like, uh, directly in the development from start to finish, then transfer to manufacturing, or it can be pure contract manufacturing after a test has been um, uh, developed elsewhere. However, regardless of at what point we're involved and what we are responsible for, we always have the same core focus. So we're relatively unique within the market in that in that we uh, have developed and manufacture some of uh, our own Ambulant Health branded tests and the quality management system processes, procedures that we would apply to our own developments and own manufacturing is something that we apply to uh, our customers also. So that core, fo core focus is very much um, high quality, robust, manufacturable test. And that's something that we will touch upon uh, a little later, but you know, it's something which really cannot be stressed enough. The best test in the world could be developed. Every bell and whistle you could possibly hope for. But actually, when you come to manufacture that test, if that consideration ha hasn't been there from very early on, you may find that it's it just simply can't cannot be manufactured for a reasonable cost that is going to en enable you to hit your uh, market pricing, you know, and, and, and obviously can have a, a major negative impact on the performance of that test within the market and, and your business plans. So we very much focus on robust, high quality, manufacturable tests. Everyone can think uh, challenges and issues that that uh, present themselves during development are unique to that development. But we've been involved in this field for a um, long enough time and across a multiple different uh, industry sectors. You know to know that there isn't much that can be uh, that can that can now challenge us that we haven't seen previously, and you know, we, we would have something in, in our sort of metaphorical uh, toolbox that could be used. So in terms of the d different industries, we, we, we have developed and we manufacture tests for uh, human health, um, animal and veterinary, uh, agricultural, environmental, food, and food safety, infectious disease, and uh, environmental diagnostics. So, each of those different type of tests can have different challenges in, in, in terms of how the sample matrix may be, may be collected, may be processed, how the sample matrix will impact you know, perhaps the biological reagents, et cetera. So any good CMO worth its salt you know, will, will, will have a strong pedigree in, in terms of uh, manufacturing a wide variety of tests, you know, and, and they may have uh, a history of test development also. So you know, they, they, it's potentially a great source um, of inf information and assistance as you move through your own particular um, development. Over recent years, uh, we have developed the um, AppDX technology also. So, and, and that's that was simply um, a response to the requirement from our customer base to perhaps move away from uh, benchtop-based lateral flow readers more to a sort of smartphone-based um, system. So, we uh, that's something that we've been involved with for um, an, a number of years, and really. How that uh, AppDX looks and is customized uh, for your particular test or a particular test is very much up to um, your requirements and what you want the end user to see and how you want them to, to use that, that smartphone reader. You know, so you can build in things such as uh, test choreography, timers, barcode readers, etc., or have something uh, that simply takes the result, displays it to the user, and stores it in, in stores it in within within the phone memory. You know. And the other end of the scale, uh, having cloud connectivity, and then that data being accessible by uh, um, uh, via a uh, uh, security um, via a secure portal by, for example, um, a, a clinician you know, to assess the uh, progression of a particular disease state or, th or things or things of that nature. So 
I hope I've just given a quick, quick sort of introduction as to as to why I'm basically here today. Um, I personally have been, have been involved with the lateral flow um, field for probably coming up to eight years now, um, I believe. And although uh, I do have a background in, in science, I, I was a humble microbiologist for many years before um, venturing into biotech and, and R&D um, and rapid test development. It's been a good 20 years since I last worked with, within a laboratory. So you will be um, you will be pleased to know our R and D director has told me on numerous times that I'll ne I will never set foot into one of her laboratories. So, so you can rest assured um, your the transfer to manufacturing, if needed, is done with a safe pair of hands, and you don't get me involved at, at the same time. So, but why why outsource lateral flow assay production? There's a number of different areas to consider really so there's a financial benefit so for example if lateral flow assay production is not your core business um by outsourcing that manufacturing you're then removing the requirement for quite significant quite heavy cap capital um, ex expenditure that budget may be then used for other purposes perhaps revenue generating uh, uh project uh, uh, projects and of course in it, it isn't enough just to have the equipment. Uh, we know from experience, you can have the best equipment in the world, but you've really got to invest in your people also. Um, although much of lateral flow assay production, you know, can be as automated as, as possible, you still need operators or production staff of a high skill level, um, many with a scientific background uh, to, you know, to be able to manufacture those tests to meet the specification agreed prior to the whole thing transferring in. So by outsourcing, you're taking away that people cost also. Obviously, if lateral flow assay production isn't your core business, then by outsourcing the manufacturing, you can then focus on on, on, on your core, core business, you know, aligning those activities with, with so high priority projects for example, and really enabling your workforce, your colleagues to do what they do best. So if that is R&D, then crack on with the R&D. Don't worry about the manufacturing, outsource it to a company that is tried and tried, um, is tried and tested and trusted w within the business. There's very much that element of um, future, future proofing the business. So, so for example, um, Within any manufacturing agreement, there will be agreed quality criteria, quality specifications, QC testing, uh, agreed lead time, delivery times, etc. So you know when you when the order is placed for the required number of tests, they're going to be delivered by the agreed by the agreed delivery date, and, you know, and there's no issue or challenge for you in the future by losing key personnel involved in um, the manufacture of those tests if you're doing them in-house and how that could impact the business. So by outsourcing business, you outsource the risk, uh, essentially, you know, which is something that um, a number of people have taken advantage of uh, over the years because it really is, uh, it, it can really be a very positive impact on uh, your future business activity. Of course, flexing you know, the operation in line with demand. So wherever tests transfer in, you know, there will be uh, a routine manufacturing batch size, you know, but, but essentially you only need to purchase what you want in line, in line with your sales forecast. You know? And if any CMO um, is worth doing business with, then they they will already have um, supply agreements with major materials manufacturers. So you can really then implement a fixed cost uh, management process. You know, um, there should not be any unexpected spikes in terms of material in, in materials cost you know if you have if your cmo has those 
uh, agreements in place, has the relationships there, and can then manage that manage that process for you. Again, really, this is all about, out, I guess, out, outsourcing um, risk again, and really, why, rein, why reinvent the wheel? So by using a good CMO, they will already have the equipment in place. I mean, here we've got a couple of images of the uh, Genolis system. They will have established processes. They will they will be certified, you know, with various regulatory bodies. To um, I've already got the people there. So you've got the equipment, you've got the people, and you've got the processes all already in place. No need for for you to spend money, spend time um, to 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 put those in into your facility. So it takes away any uh, time associated with ordering equipment because you know, for the best will in the world um sometimes a bottleneck can be uh equipment lead time so take away that and, and of course any spikes in demand you know can be quite easily handled by your uh, CMO, as long as you know you've done the due diligence side of things you've chosen a CMO which has the capability to really respond to pressures the market may exert on you. Perhaps in terms of uh, increasing batch size, increasing the number of batches needed over a relatively short space of time. You know? So the CMO has to have that has to have that sort of capability, that footprint necessary to if need be in in inc increase production to meet to meet your requirements. How can a CMO assist you otherwise? Well, use the user CMO to, to become more competitive, you know, to, to do that and you want stable long-term pricing. So as, as I said previously, your CMO should have a robust, um, strong supply chain in, in place and can make use of that existing supply chain and uh, logistical processes in place to make sure that you've got that long-term manufacturing cost. You're not going to be uh, experience unexpected um, spikes in, in terms of in terms of cost. And it, it allows you to plan properly and also allows your CMO to plan and really and really um, uh, in, enhances, you know, which the, the partnership, which, you know, it, 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 really, it really should be. Something I'll talk about a, a little bit later, you know, is that you, you, a CMO shouldn't just be a manufacturer insight. You know, the CMO should really be your eyes and ears with, within the marketplace. So you know, there may be regulatory support required, which there certainly has been for an, an, a, n a number of companies recently with, with, with changes to uh, uh, European regulation. Now, they may... Uh, logistical support. You know, so rather than the CMO expecting you to supply all the raw materials, um, the biologicals, the, the componentry, and they manufacture and then ship back and they ship back to you to ship on to the customer. You know, there may be a requirement you know, simply because of available space within your facility that actually the CMO will will, will handle um, the supply chain, the logistics for all of the components of, of your test. Um, you know, and there may even, even be areas in terms of uh, commercial activity that, that uh, your CMO could uh, assist you with. Perhaps access in different markets through existing distribution um, and channel sales networks the CMO already has, etc. And I guess the so the last area I, I would touch upon really is, you know, it's, again, it's about that outsourcing the risk. It's, it's the support and reassurance. So you would obviously have uh, within a CMO a dedicated project team that may handle the transfer of your test into routine manufacturing, but you would have a dedicated account manager. There would be points of contact within quality, QC, QA, um, operations, and those regular routine calls business reviews, et cetera, can make sure that your uh, 
CMO activity is aligned fully with your business goals, which has been, you know, which really can't be emphasized and stressed enough during the, during the current situation with uh, the global pandemic. You know that the, the, the re, the re, the, there's had to have been um, a much greater cooperation and contact between uh, customers and CMO to make sure that those tests are delivered where they're needed um, to the right people. So I think we sort of covered why there may be a, a requirement to outsource lateral flow assay production and some of the benefits outsourcing the production can um, give. But I guess we should talk about, well, when should the CMO be, be involved? Now, I, from, from my perspective um, and from my personal opinion, um, I would say, as early as possible. Um, there has to be that focus in development from a very, very early stage, how that test is going to be manufactured, how that test, that R, the, the R&D scale, those sort of bench scale production, how is that going to be scaled up? Um, you know, materials, processes, equipment, all need to be considered at a very, very early stage. And so, Otherwise, you're simply not going to achieve high throughput production and the, and the, the capability to produce uh, routinely high quality, robust tests to meet your desired timeline or to get into the market, uh, to get a foot in the door, uh, essentially, versus, versus your competition. Now, how can the CMO assist you? Well, at those early stages, there may not be any direct experimental work that the CMO would assist you with, but there is that advisory capacity. You know, again, you, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So working with a CMO from the start of a development can significantly re reduce risk. Um, and I really can't stress enough that what can work in, in R&D may not translate onto the large automated lateral flow manufacturing equipment. You know, so, for example, the materials you initially choose for the R&D work you know, may be perfectly fine in terms of uh, uh, flow rate you know, for, the, for the sample um, to, to move through, through the test. You may see a nice positive line, and when you get to that point, you're in a development. If you, if you develop a, a sandwich assay, but the worst case scenario is that material, perhaps the microcellulose membrane, the material that you've chosen, it, it simply lacks the tensile strength that it, it can't be used on a, a real to real automated system. You know, and again, having to change something at a late stage in development or as you're transferring to manufacturing is going to be costly in terms of money and, and time. So, you know, I, I do I do urge everyone listening you know, to, to really consider using a CMO um, to save you time and money you know, and don't reinvent the wheel. You know, it, the CMO will have advice, will know the best options in terms of, you know, that sample matrix, um, that type of test that you want to develop and manufacture, you know, and as an advisory role, you know, can, can really make a positive impact. So this diagram you know, really um, illustrates some of the typical stages, if, if you like, during a uh, development pathway for a lateral flow assay. You know, so where, where in that pathway, you know, should you involve? A CMO. Well, I mean, ultimately, it's your it's your choice. Um, I mean, for, for, I'm talking from personal experience, uh, from an ambient and health perspective. As a CMO, we can be involved right at the beginning. Um, so, if uh, a customer, for example, decides to outsource not just the manufacturing, but if it's a you know if lateral flow is is non core to, to the R and D team, you know they may decide to outsource some of that risk of the development, um, and outsource the R and D to us also. So and obviously that's gonna if if that's possible, you know it, it's gonna depend whether your CMO of, of choice um, you know is purely manufacturing, or also has a uh, development 
capability also. So, for example, you know, as I said, in case in, in some cases, we can be evolved, evolved from the very early stage, proof of concept, you know, and we operate a system here, which is, I think it's common to uh, many companies um, with, within the, the rapid testing sector, essentially. You know, it's a very modular approach with a feasibility to optimization, to scale up, to, te to technical transfer. So, where your test may fit into our pathway, you know, will will be dictated by how much work, how much R and D has obviously been done prior to it coming into us as a contract manufacturing organization. So, typically, if a test has been developed, it may be uh, developed up to you know, the end of optimization, and it's then time to scale up and then transfer for. Routine, routine manufacturing. You know? So that's a very common approach. Uh, that, that, that scale up is basically necessary. So, for example, within R and D, um, you may have been manufacturing tests uh, on a on a very sort of bench scale, uh, bench top um, process, and perhaps there's been no um, uh, no testing of of that initial des of of that design on you know, common by a real to real system, um, you know, in, in terms of uh, dispensing reagent, in terms of the auto laminator, etc. So that scalar process you know, is, is is very important to make sure that what's being done at an R and D scale uh, can be scaled up effectively onto the manufacturing equipment, you know, and it's from there then moving moving to the uh, te technical transfer and then ultimately routine manufacturing. You know, but again, this is something that your uh, CMO should be aware of. And, you, and really, you know, it's it's your choice, but your CMO should be prepared um, you know, to, to be involved at those earlier stages, even if it is from um, an, an, advi um, an advisory uh, perspective, just to make sure, as we said previously, you know, that the materials that they are, they are looking at, um, the processes, that you're considering to, to manufacture you know, are all suitable for high throughput routine manufacturing. So if we talk that a little bit uh, further and look at it in a bit more depth, really. So where should you involve the CMO? Well, one thing for me is materials. So you could look at it as you know, what a successful manufacturing involved, you know, from a, a lateral flow assay. Well, um, you, know, you conjugate your labels and your antibodies effectively. You know, those labels could be uh, gold nanoparticles, you know, they could be, the gold could be spherical, it could be nanorods, could be looking at cellulose uh, beads, could be looking at uh, fluorescent particles, platinum, carbon, you know, there's um, latex, there's a whole host of particles out there. You know, obviously you want the best particle for your particular test. So you conjugate the labels to the antibodies effectively. You, know, you select and, and, and apply the, the right reagents, in terms of surfactants, things of those nature, and the and components. So you know, the nitrocellulose membrane, you want your sample pad, your conjugate pad, your upper wick, you assemble all that into a um, housing, make sure they all work together um, you know, to deliver tests according to your uh, quality specifications. I mean. Sounds easy, doesn't it? You know, but um, I think we all know that the, in each choice, in each element within those multiple working parts of a lateral flow assay, you know, if if you don't get that particular component right, there will be a knock on. There will be a knock on effect. If if that if if that the issue with that component carries on through development. You may come to the point where you want to transfer it to manufacturing, and your CMO may point out immediately, "Look, we've used well, we've we've used that particular material in the past. We know we know it causes problems X, Y, and Z." Now, you then have a choice. The test could be manufactured as is with that element, you know, and 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 really, um, you know, accepting that element of risk of that particular component, or there's that. Uh, choice there to spend time, money, 
to swap that component out. So, so again, having the CMO in, involved, you know, at a relatively uh, early stage, you, you you can make use of the CMO's experience. You know, and and and, and you know, really, there's no need. Then, as I've said previously, um, and forgive me if I repeat this numerous times, no, no need to reinvent the wheel. If your CMO that you've chosen you know, has the experience and the expertise when it comes not only to manufacturing tests, but also what's developing tests, and they will be able to assist you with all, with all of these um, areas that really should should be considered. You know, so for example, there's a, as you can imagine, there's a huge variety of different of uh, uh, sample matrices, you know, depending on what the test is going to analyze and who the end user is, is going to be. So if a test is being developed and it's whole milk, there's that high fat content to consider. If it's whole blood, you know, you want to strip, strip out the red blood cells. So they could potentially mask um, you know, uh, the red test line if you're using gold. There, there's a whole host of um, things to consider. I mean, saliva, uh, you know, the, the number of times I, 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 I've been, you know, I've been in a meeting and we're talking about the development and plus manufacturing of, of a saliva matrix based test, you know, and, and people will, will always sort of agree with that sort of wry smile that, you know, yes, you think saliva should should be an easy sample matrix because it's, you know, it's 98% water. Uh, it's the other 2% that causes all of all of the challenges really, you know, to uh, uh, overcome. So what are the best materials to allow high throughput automated production? Because if you if you plan on um, supplying in, into your market, you know, um, 100, 200, hundred, two hundred, five hundred thousand tests a month, you know, you don't want those made by hand. You know, the, um, you want it to be as automated as possible to drive down drive down the manufacturing costs. You know, and to take away as, as much potential human error as uh, um, possible. Now, in terms of those materials. You know, does your, does your CMO of choice have long-term supply agreements? Now, this is this has become an important important factor really during this year, you know, because there has been such a demand from a wide variety of companies to develop um, a COVID nineteen test. You know, so luckily. Uh, We've been in this game long enough that, that we have very good relationships, you know, with um, like cellulose membrane suppliers, uh, suppliers of sample pads, upper up, uh, wicks, you know, backing card, etc. That we are we already have those agreements in 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 place, and we can work with with our vendors, you know, to to um, to assist us if our demand in increases now um you know i certainly wouldn't want to have been in a position this year of suddenly going out to the market looking for a supply for net cellulose um, membrane when there, you know, there was a huge demand for that particular material so there may have been stock issues the i mean the other thing to bear in mind um in in terms of uh your CMO having a robust supply chain you know it's not only that no risk to the continuity of of supply you know, but, but for example any uh, any required changes in uh, material, perhaps if things have been discontinued, you know. So you need a CMO to be have that relationship with the supplier to be able to manage those those component changes, you know. And and we need to, again to be your uh, eyes and ears within the market, you know, to know if there's something that's approaching on, on the horizon and it could impact, you know, in the material you need to to produce. Your test, then having that relationship, having that knowledge beforehand, you know, can go a long way to uh, minimise any any negative impact. You know, and again, I know something that I, I missed previously, but just having that and having that experience, having that expertise to know well, are those components that have been selected, are they suitable for uh, automated manufacturing? So again, uh, you know. Where should, where, where should you involve uh, your chosen CMO? Well, a good CMO will not only have experience and, and expertise, but they, they also have those processes in, in place. So using your CMO at a relatively early, early stage, you know, prior to a test transferring in, um, you know, will ensure that the assets being developed can be transferred in efficiently and within... Uh, and really, an optimized uh, time frame. 
So to get that test into routine manufacturing, get that test out to, to, your, to your customers. So again, you don't want to be reinventing the wheel. You know, um, you want to use those sort of tried and tested processes, procedures that, you know, as I mentioned previously, whereas in Abingdon, the same procedures and processes we use for our Abingdon Health branded products are those that are applied to our uh, contract manufacturing uh, tests. And you know, it's going to mean that those critical pro uh, process parameters and control points associated with the process, with the equipment, are already going to be defined, you know, and um, they, those that process is, is, is going to provide a, a reproducible and robust manufacturing, you know, process. The last thing you want is to have errors, quality problems, batch after batch after batch. I mean, that just should not be the situation whatsoever. So, by involving your CMO at the newly point within the product development, you know, keeping those touch, po touch points as the development proceeds, we are going to use um, and you know we are go going to make use of your uh, CMO's expertise, experience, and their existing automation on their existing equipment again. Reducing the uh, reducing the requirement for you to spend time and money putting these things in place. I'm sure you sure you you're, you're aware um, lateral flow immunoassays or, or lateral flow assay tests can be manufactured by hand. You know, but for routine manufacturing, you you really want that to be automated as much as as much as possible by working with a CMO at an, at an early point, you, you, you're going to know, you know, you, you, you're going to have that um, input from a CMO regarding, well, in terms of a test design, what is suitable for automation, what is not. You know, so things that we need to be considered, um, as you can imagine, the equipment to be employed to manufacture, you know, the R and D batches, perhaps in in house. Um, how does that equipment compare, you know, to the manufact the manufacturing equipment your CMO will use? You know, so, as I mentioned, um, how does your equipment compare to, for example, uh, the Biodot reel to reel reagent dispensers, uh, auto lamination equipment, th things of that nature, and ultimately. How translatable is your R and D production to routine production with, with, within within the CMO? Okay, so you know, again, have, having those conversations, um, having input from a CMO at the particular points through 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 the development, you know, you're really gonna all that prep work is going to be done. So. What you want from a CMO then is an efficient, fast, optimized transfer to manufacturing. Okay, you know, there's nobody likes any surprises. Essentially, I mentioned technical transfer a number of times. I mean, in many cases, um, this is actually where we would anticipate seeing tests that you know that may have been developed elsewhere may or may already be uh, commercially available you know and th there's a requirement to transfer them in to a CMO. so you know, it, it's basically um, a process where you verify that, that manufacturing that routine manufacturing process um is suitable you know and it, it really be sort of split into two areas uh you know i'm sure that you're aware of this in terms of uh, batch manufacturing so you know, accurate, reproducible and robust assay that allows repeatable batches to be to be produced um, to meet the quality criteria. So typically um, we would we would carry sort of three uh, manufacturing three transfer transfer batches. There's also that documentation element to it and obviously to make batch records are, are complete you know, which can which um, can go into uh, the necessary Technical dossiers, perhaps used for uh, regulatory purposes, and you know, I think a key element is that you know obviously your CMO has to take the lead with regard to this process. Um, 
it's in the CMO's interest to move that test into routine man in, into into routine manufacturing. You know, and I, I I can't think of any CMO that would want to um, purposely extend that technical transfer process. You know, but a good CMO will, will will also also resist the temptation to cut corners. You know, because you really have to demonstrate repeatable production of batches in terms of quality in terms of not only the product but also also the repeatability and robustness of the process in place you know and cutting any corners is just a recipe for disaster further, further on down the line so I, I i would urge everyone to really as the slide suggests to take the lead from the cmo with regard to what's required for technical transfer so i think we've um you probably heard me say this uh, a number of times, you know. But if you can, uh, you know, talk to your the or even if you haven't thought about manufacturing your assay, you know, yet. I mean, speak to companies involved in this field, um, you know, even if it's primarily for uh, advisory input. Um, you know, it's. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth your while. I mean, um, by working with that CMO, you know, and, and and having that CMO in place, ready to accept the test post development for for manufacturing, you know, is is really really going to assist in that development process. You know, and and really you know, make sure the quality management system that the CMO is working to is um, suitable. Uh, However, I mean the one thing um, I would I mean I would always I, I, I would always suggest people to research uh, before choosing a CMO. You know, is what do they offer except you know, manufacturing? I mean the, um, the the CMO should be your you know, at least your eyes and ears within within the market. You know, so in terms of you know helping you through that's a regulatory and commercial landscape so you know, what reg what regulatory support is there now you may find um you may find a company can develop a lateral flow assay it can manufacture a lateral flow assay up to a certain batch size um company may develop the tests may manufacture and you know up to the batch size you know five hundred thousand test plus um you may find other companies that purely all they do is contract manufacturing now, what you're, the question you also have to ask is, you know, well, what can you, or how can you support me in terms of that commercial and regulatory landscape? Now, something I'm, I think we're very fortunate within Abingdon is because we've developed and manufactured our own tests, and we have had to make that investment in terms of a very strong QA and, and RA department. So we can support our customers in terms of current and future regulation. Will that be some sort of FDA sort of five ten k? That obviously should be um, extra marks if anyone noticed that before me. Um, CE marking and you know the imminent Im implementation of uh, uh, IVDR. So so. As you know, by I think it's, I think it's by the 26th of, of, of May 2022, um, all IVD sold in the EU don't need to adhere to the new uh, IVDR. I think it's 2017 forward stroke 746. So you know, which replaces the original IVDD. Now, it's thought that this will impact 80%. Of IVDs actually sold within the EU, and so so your CMO should already, you know, have been very much uh, not only aware of of what's coming down the road, you know, but working with their customers to um, assist them in what needs to be done, what changes need to be done, um, you know, really to, to to get those tests mark market ready. Now. Your CMO, CMO may also have the capability, you know, to and to be to be to, um, undertake the legal manufacturer status on on your behalf, you know. So, but there's the, there's those 
other areas that the CMO can assist also, you know, so um, packaging solutions, you know, it's it, at some points actually getting the test device assembled into a foil pouch with a desk and label is the, maybe you know, almost the easiest part of, of, of that process. You know, you've, you've then, well, what about all, all the peripheral uh, uh, components, et cetera, you know, so perhaps you use your CMO within the development process to advise and assist on, well, what's going to be the um, uh, optimal sample collection method, sample treatment, what componentry w w would be required, what are those sort of commercial um, aspects you know, that need to be considered? So potential dis distribution uh, channels, you know, even supporting you within commercial negotiation. And so there's a whole variety of um, aspects where the CMO, sh your, your, your chosen CMO should be able to assist you with, you know, and be much more than just the manufacturer. So I would just like to take uh, a couple of moments just to really give you a, um, a bit of a sort of case study here, which really shows all areas how a CMO um, can assist assist you. So this um, uh, relates to the ABC-19 uh, rapid test. So this is something that we, end we undertook as part of the uh, UK rapid test consortium, uh, taking on the lead manufacturer um, status. So we were involved at the, from a very early stage in that developing the test, you know, which was really done uh, um, at an, an exceptional uh, timeline in, in, in terms of um, that development development process, you know, and, and you, know, you, you could argue the point, well, if it can be done for this test, it could be done for, for other tests, but um, this was really a sort of valiant effort from from, from colleagues with, within R&D and, and tech transfer, you know, sort of working around the clock, split shifts, um, and really applying as much resource as was needed to get this important test developed. You know, so it's essentially um, uh, an antibody test looking at the uh, IgG you know, for use through um, the, the population, you know, uh, whole blood finger prick test. Now, this is this is an area where We've been involved, as I said, in the development. We have, uh, we, 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 with other consortium members, we've been manufacturing the test, but we've also been pivotal in terms of the regulatory aspects. So really taking on all of those uh, necessary um, uh, workflow requirements to facilitate this test being developed, manufactured, and out into the market, where you know it's it's it it, it it's a very important test that, that is needed to uh, uh, respond to current events. So, I guess in um, I guess all I can do is thank you for your attention. Um, I, you know, I I hope you will. Have, I, I hope you found this. Uh, interesting and, and informative. Um, I look forward to any questions and thank you for your attention. Jonathan, thank you for that outstanding presentation. We will now move into the live Q&A portion of our presentation. So now as a reminder to our audience, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. Okay. Jonathan, our first question. If you had to give someone one piece of advice about developing a test for manufacturing, what would it be? Um, I think the best piece of advice uh, I could possibly give would be don't don't cut the corners. Um, there will always be the um, the option from you know from from some development companies, some manufacturing companies, or even an internal pressure, you know, to, to really speed things along, uh, you know, because ultimately to get the test out into the marketplace to start generating uh, revenue. But often that can be, you know, 
a recipe for a disaster uh, essentially and so um any any development pathway you know there will be elements of that de of that development which can run in parallel if the you know if if, if sufficient technical resource is is available but wherever there's the temptation you know to perhaps actually well we just live with the, the, the potential risk of not doing x y and z in the development and then we do them at the end if need be you know, that, that can just you know it, it is just just uh kicking the can down the road and there could be a whole host of unwelcome surprises when you are ready to transfer it into manufacturing that have to be remedied at that point sure thank you what size batches should be produced when a test is transferred into manufacturing um the one thing to bear in mind um well, i mean just to give you the sort of urban health approach so we would manufacture uh, three validation or three tra transfer batches now we tend to take the approach of sort of low media which is probably not not the right words to, to use really but the one thing that, that should all that should always be the goal is that third and final validation batch should be at the anticipated um uh, routine production batch size so that will that will be based on the customer's initial sales forecast and the reason being you you want to demonstrate that that test can be manufactured um in a, in, in a repeatable way but it can be manufactured at the scale it is going to be done on a routine basis so you don't want to transfer a test to manufacture it say for 10,000 you know a batch size of 10,000 tests and then within a couple of months there's a realization that the test has taken off in in in, in the market and actually a hundred thousand tests are needed per batch and there's a whole host of things to look at then in terms of conjugate stability um qc procedures etc you know and there can be an element of work then to scale up to the required routine batch size so low medium high but that sort of high if you like is the routine batch size thank you for that answer now we have some great questions coming in so i want to make sure we have time to answer them let's go with this next one um great job john given the current pandemic there seems to be a lack of cmo capacity globally does abington health have capacity to take on new projects yeah i mean it's it can be a challenge. Um, it, you know, it can certainly it can certainly depend on um, uh, current production schedules, etc. I mean, we're very conscious that we have um, we have customers that have been with us have been done before the pandemic and will be with us after the pandemic. So you know, we certainly have made sure that those customers have been prioritised you know, to, to to maintain that, that continuity of supply but i mean it's one of the reasons why um uh, our ceo chris h took the um sort of decision we need to invest to make sure we invest in the infrastructure in terms of manufacturing capacity um, equipment footprint so we i think by the end of this year we should be up to a million tests a mm -hmm. week capacity and there'll be uh, i think there's another expansion and plan for next year to, to take that further so there is capacity available i mean you know it, it's very it 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 is in high demand um but we are approaching it you know with a sort of cool head and um in a, in a very methodical manner really you know so to make sure that the orders are in um customers are, are fully aware you know, it's very transparent uh, as to what the lead time is is going to be and we've been looking at um modifying sort of work plans etc so not just bringing in extra equipment but we've, we've, we've also uh, greatly increased the the, uh, the workforce within those areas to make sure the capacity is there that's great to hear good our next question let's see um there's so many great questions are you able to help new startup with guidance on how to obtain grants funding in order to help them get through the development process, for example, with Gates Foundation submissions. 
Um, yes, yes. I mean, we can, you know, we um, we have a long history of with a wide variety of um, companies, are from from startups, spin outs from universities through to multinationals. So, yeah, we, I mean, if well, you know, if uh, I can I can respond to them directly with my contact details, and yeah, you know. We can certainly have a chat, and uh, if, if I can advise them or a colleague can, you know, we certainly will. Great. And we do have all of everyone's uh, email addresses for those who are submitting questions. So any questions we are unable to answer today and any of the questions that come in during the on-demand period, uh, you will be able to answer those via email. So okay. we have time for just maybe two more. So let's squeeze a couple in here. Um, does Abington do microfluidic cartridges too? And would you have a recommended CMO for microfluidics? Um, we don't currently. Um, again, I'll take that offline and speak with some colleagues. Um, and there may be some companies that we can suggest. You know, we're very sort of collaborative in, uh, within, within the industry, and you know, there's lots of. Uh, Lots of possible connections there you know, that, uh, that we can uh, that we can call upon. So yeah, I'll reply to that person, and if if we can help or we can put information, I certainly will. Great, and um, let's go with this question because it seems like a very popular topic in 2020 right now. Obviously, um, currently, are you still being approached to develop tests that are non-COVID related? Absolutely yes, and um, I, I I must confess when we are, you know, it's it's an absolute breath of fresh air. You know, it, it, it seems to have been everything's been COVID related since it seems all year, doesn't it? So um, yes, yeah. I mean, there are still tests um, being developed out there which have nothing to do with uh, COVID nineteen, and we have and we we have much um, recently started and. Um, yeah, and there's a couple more due to start shortly. So yeah, it's still going on. Great. And Jonathan, we have time for one more question. So let's wrap with this one. If customers wish to transfer their design into you for manufacture, do you have a preferred suppliers you'd prefer to work with for reagents, pads, membranes, et cetera? Or are you open in your approach to whatever works best in the development? Yeah, so um, a, a term we often use is we are, in theory, particle materials agnostic. So, you know, it's very much a case of looking what has been used perhaps to develop in the test development before it comes in before it comes into our bin then um you know, we have very strong relationships with all of the main suppliers um not just for the sort of usual sort of suspect in, in terms of, of, of radius materials but also you know, um, housings etc so we would very much be focused on well, what's best for the test what what's best to um, deliver a test in which meets those uh, initials of test specifications. It's, it's, it's going to deliver a test which meets the end user requirements. But we certainly wouldn't be um, you know, looking to crowbar in a particular material, you know, in, into that test. Um, you know, we we don't actually manufacture so sort of nanoparticles ourselves, and so we're very much open to what's the best material to fit that test specification um, you know, and what's been done previously. If it can be improved, if there is something that we know of, um, you know, we certainly will discuss that with the um, customer and um, you know, and a decision can then be made. Be a, we, but we certainly wouldn't be looking to change things for the sake of it. Great. And Jonathan, okay. unfortunately, we're out of time. We had so many great questions okay. coming in. There's quite a few that we weren't able to answer. But do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, I mean, the uh, I think we're going. To, I think a lot more people are now um, aware of lateral flow assays. Um, there's probably been a mix 
in the media of sort of good reviews, bad reviews, you know, based on current sort of world events. And um, I think, you know, where where there's, there may be negative press, I mean, I think that's primarily down to um, corners being cut, um, things not being thought through completely, and, you know, and, and tests being rushed out onto the market. Okay, so I, it's a, it's, an assay um, type which is going to be with us again for you know, for decades, as it has been um, previously, and um, I think you know, for, for the industry, you know, there's certainly a, a challenge in, but also exciting few years ahead of us. Sure, that makes sense. Um, so, Jonathan, thank you so much. Uh, we so appreciate your time. Um, I want to do remind, <laughs> thank you. And I do re want to remind our audience that those questions that we did not answer and any of those that are submitted during the on demand period, they will be addressed via email. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this presentation will be available for on demand viewing. I just want to remind you to share it with your colleagues who might be interested in today's topic. And don't miss out on other presentations on our agenda. Thank you again for, part for participating and we hope you have a great day. Thanks for joining us.